Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I hope you're doing swell. I'm Jake, the friendly Ash and Hollow, and this video has been wildly demanded and I am here to serve your needs. Basically, I'm going to give you all of my updated thoughts on Velka and relook at some of my theories regarding her. If you haven't seen the videos already, I'm definitely going to link them in the description. I think there's about four of them, at least. Uh, I would suggest watching them before watching this and kind of, you can kind of see how my theories have evolved. I went from maybe thinking, oh, she could be maybe one of the sisters of the Sable Church, to evolving that into perhaps she's their mother, and then into how I got into her maybe maybe being the Furtive Pygmy, or maybe being the Witch of Izalith. Um, yeah, I would suggest watching those before watching this, because I'm going to be referencing those, so you might not understand where I'm coming from. I think, most importantly, the last two uh, would be the most important uh, for this video to make as much sense as it can. <laughs> but, anyways, let me preface this with... Any theory I've put into a video, whether I change my opinion or stance on in the future, I still believe it can make sense and has its merits. In fact, there are several matters in the game that I have like 5 to 10 different thoughts on that can all make sense, and I'm sure you guys get what I'm saying. It's just what Dark Souls does. Now, while we can have multiple theories that can make sense, it's up to us at the end of the day to decide which we think personally makes the most sense. So that's what I'm going to be doing here with Velka. I'll give you all my updated information on her and what theories about her make the most sense to me. Oh, and also, as a bonus, to address another question I've been asked quite a bit, I'm going to explain why Velka is associated with crows, since it actually never specifically states that in-game. So let's jump right into it. Let's start with probably my most controversial theory that Velka is the Witch of Izalith, as well as the Furtive Pygmy. Now, I really do love this theory. It's easily my favorite one, and I do think it can and does make sense, but I'm not sure it's the most reasonable or likely. Now, what makes the most sense to me is Velka being either one of the two, rather than all of the above. Could Velka be the Witch of Izalith, who narrowly escaped a death or a worse fate, and as atonement for her transgressions became a goddess of sin? That does make sense, and it's something that could be likely. Or is Velka simply the furtive pygmy? That is much more likely to me, which, really quickly, another tidbit I found that helps solidify that Manus is not the furtive pygmy is the fact that Gale is searching for the Dark Soul of Man, and in the upcoming Ringed City DLC, we will be following Gale to the ends of the world to find the Dark Soul. Now who has the Dark Soul? The furtive pygmy, right? And Manus was destroyed. So that along with the other findings in my past videos makes me fairly confident in saying there's no way Manus is the pygmy. So just one more rabbit trail before I start talking about Velka again, I want to talk about the Dark Soul itself. For as long as I can remember, the general consensus on what humanity was, was just fragments of the Dark Soul. It makes sense, our progenitor found the Dark Soul, shouldn't it be what humans are made of? I buy it, it's logical, it's what I believed up until recently. If we believe the opening cinematic of Dark Souls 1, which we likely should, then what the furtive pygmy is holding is not humanity, it just looks like a smaller lord soul. So if that is the case, then how could humanity be fragments of the Dark Soul? They look nothing alike. So here's a picture of a lord soul. It kind of looks like a soul, where the white part is in the center, contained by fire. The fiery part, he said sarcastically. But humanity looks like dark, contained by a soul. And perhaps that is what makes humans so drastically different than the rest of the inhabitants of the world. Perhaps since the furtive pygmy was likely human upon finding the dark soul, that is why there's such a strong bond between them. So maybe humanity is just what separates humans from hollows. Or maybe it's a combination of both. We hear often in the game that there is a darkness inside man. Generally, most people take that as a bad thing. This dark could be what separates humans from the rest of the world, why others look down on them, because of the darkness within them. But maybe when the furtive pygmy found the dark soul, they used that to help contain the darkness, which is again why when we look at humanity, we see dark encompassed by soul. 
the Dark Soul is the unique Lord Soul of the three, and I believe this is why. So back to Velka on this topic. Something I find interesting is her miracles. In this instance, not their descriptions, but the visuals were presented with. In a very similar fashion in which we see the dark contained by a soul on humanity, likely done by the Furtive Pygmy, in Velka's miracles, we see dark contained by her incantations and rings of purple. That's incredibly peculiar. If Velka is the Furtive Pygmy, perhaps she learned to control the Dark in a similar manner that she has contained it with the Dark Soul. And we can see this practice reflected in her miracles as well. At what point does this and all the other evidence I've provided in the prior videos stop being just coincidence after coincidence, and when does it become Velka is a very serious contender for Furtive Pygmy? If and hopefully when we meet the Furtive Pygmy, I don't think it'll be a completely new character. The Pygmy we know is easily forgotten. I think it's an encounter or name we've already heard before. So let's talk about Londor now. I've gone over it before, and I believe it's common knowledge now that while we don't know of what degree, that Velka had something to do with the Sable Church in one way or another. A quick checklist on that thought is the all-black attire, crow masks, possession of Velka's secret rites, having the only vendor to sell rings of sacrifice, and so on and so forth. My final thoughts are that Velka is the mother of the three sisters, Frida, Yuria, and Lillian, who founded the church. Now here is something interesting. We know the ring of sacrifice is associated with Velka. In Dark Souls 1, we had the ring of sacrifice and the rare ring of sacrifice. We see the ring make a return in Dark Souls 3, except in 3, there is no rare ring of sacrifice, which my guess is because the only extra thing the rare ring does is remove curse, and curse doesn't work the same way in 3 as it does in 1, but the rare ring was supposed to be in 3 but was cut. Either way, in both games, they used the exact same design for both rings, and user Marty McFly pointed out something very interesting in that we can see in the rare ring of sacrifice three silhouettes inside the ring, which I think is symbolic of the three dollars of Velka, which is super cool because that would mean it has been planned since Dark Souls 1. I don't see who else these three, specifically three again, silhouettes could be if not for the three founders of the Church of Londor and Daughters to Velka. Something else that I'm not actually sure if I mentioned before is what can be traded with Snuggly the Crow. And let me state these trades are not random. For example, when creating the game they didn't say, okay, well we'll have the players be able to get more Titanite chunks by trading items, so just pick some random shit for them to trade. No, for whatever reason, each of the items and their corresponding items are planned. We get two divine blessings for trading the Ring of the Sun Princess, so it isn't random coincidences. Anyways, for one humanity, we receive a Ring of Sacrifice, and for a twin humanity, we receive a rare Ring of Sacrifice. So again, more and more of these coincidences aren't just chance anymore. There is something here, and it's something big. So in the rulebook for the Dark Souls board game, there is an excerpt about the story that I guess we have to take as canon because the game is now Bandai Namco official, but it's talking about the Age of Fire and the state of the world after Gwyn unnaturally extends it, and it says, It is in this miserable state that the world has now existed for a thousand years and more, always on the brink of the Age of Dark despite the best efforts of the agents of the Fourth Lord, the Furtive Pygmy. Which is interesting to me. So we know Koth is a factor in the Sable Church, and we know he wanted the Age of Dark to come during Dark Souls 1. So whether or not he's manipulative or a liar, we can confidently say he wants an Age of Dark or an Age of Man to dawn. So in doing so in Dark Souls 1, Koth wants us to become the Dark Lord to usher in the New Age. He mentions that there have been several Dark Lords before him that have tried and failed. So with that information, and with the information we have on Velka, I think we can confidently say that whether or not we think she is the Furtive Pygmy, she is pretty clear-cut about setting nature back on course and bringing about the Age of Dark. She is the Goddess of Sin, after all. So something I've questioned is, why, if Velka is on this side of things, wasn't she an attempt at a Dark Lord? 
I can't see why not unless she was the furtive pygmy herself and sent her agents to do so. I think that the mandate of the furtive pygmy is to correct the course of nature and bring about the dark. It is the same one we see instilled into the painted world. When we show the painter flame and the rot begins to burn away, the Corvian settler tells us that burning away the world for the sake of the next one is the one thing they do right, unlike the people in the outside world. So we see this principle popping up around the pygmy and of course Velka, since we know how associated with the painted world she is. And it just makes so much sense for that mandate to come from Velka. And also a kind of random thing I wanted to point out as well, in the discussion about what form Frida could have taken that was what the denizens of the painted world yearned for, I've always suspected it to be Velka, but quite a few people think it's Priscilla, and they tell me it's because of her bare feet. Which, I get the argument, but let me just point out something real quick. The statue of Velka strongly appears to have bare feet as well. So there's that. And of course, the statue of Velka offers salvation and comfort to humans and hollows, which would be fitting of their progenitor. So let's do a summary recap before we go into that juicy bonus content. I still enjoy the theory that Velka could be the Witch of Isolith and the Furtive Pygmy. It certainly has its merits and supporting evidence. It is certainly one of the most fun theories I've ever had, and I'll always enjoy it and always find ways to continue to back it up. But my more official stance is on Velka being one or the other. I think she could be the Witch of Isolith. I think there's still a lot of evidence to support that, and there are even a lot of supporting factors and characters that could easily tie into that. I like that theory. I still believe it's very plausible, but I more so think that she is the furtive pygmy. It makes a lot more sense and just seems like perfection to the storyline. All right, bonus time! So, why is Velka referenced as a crow? They never actually once say anything along those lines in the game. So where are we getting this from? It's actually something that is a very rational question, and one I haven't seen addressed too many times. I myself have had a few conversations trying to explain it. Some successful, some not. You know how it goes. So here it is. The crow demons in the painted world, in the original Japanese translation, they're called People of Velka. In an interview, Miyazaki said this. The crow demons came about during the initial concept stages. I always thought of the painted world as somewhere where things go to escape, and the birdmen are no different. They were originally designed as worshippers of the goddess Velka, whose bodies were warped by their devotion. I think this obsession makes them really interesting characters. So, worshippers of Velka whose devotion warped their bodies into crows? That should be enough evidence right there, but you know my ass is gonna keep going. Crows are a corvus, part of the Corvidae family, which contains crows, ravens, rooks, jackdaws, and some other little shits. Anyways, the corvus are highly intelligent species of birds, and we know Velka's talisman and miracles scale with intelligence rather than faith. Then there's the mask of Velka, which forms a bird's beak, as well as the build mask looks much more crow-like in Dark Souls 3. And of course, the standard all-black attire complements the all-black feathers of a crow. And finally, in the good old olden times, crows were actually thought to be witches who could bewitch themselves into familiars. So you know, just all that shit together makes a pretty compelling case as to why Velka is referenced as a crow. So, I want to thank you dudes and dudes for watching. I hope you enjoyed my updated thoughts on Velka. I know it's something you've been waiting for for a while. If luck will have it, this won't be my last Velka video. I'm really hoping and thinking we're gonna get more information about her from the DLC. And if it turns out I'm right and she is the furtive pygmy, then I think we'll even be seeing her. If you haven't subscribed, I hope you will. And of course, click that little bell next to the sub button to make sure you get notified when I upload. Follow me on Twitter for any channel related updates and stream times, and follow me on Twitch so you can catch when I go live. If supporting me, keeping up with all the lore on the channel is something that has ever crossed your mind, consider visiting my Patreon. All these links are of course in the description. So thanks again everyone, I hope you have a great rest of the day, and sweet dreams if you're about to go to bed. Until next time.